fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, pleomorphic xanthroestrocytoma. What is a rare disease? A disease that is not common or is insignificant? A rare disease is a condition that affects fewer than one in 2,000 individuals. Some diseases are very rare, even ultra rare, affecting only a few individuals or families globally. But rare does not mean insignificant. Their impact on individuals' lives is real, and their impact on the healthcare system is real. And the statistics are sobering. There are approximately 7,000 known rare diseases, 80% of which have a known genetic cause. Children account for more than 50% of rare disease diagnosis. One in 12 Canadians is living with a rare disease, but many are dying of them. 30% of children <clears throat> diagnosed with a rare disease will die before the age of five. But what can we do? Discover new treatments, provide access to treatments that already exist, or facilitate earlier diagnosis. During my graduate degree at the University of Toronto and the Hospital for Sick Children, I started working on rare diseases. The complexity of just one rare disease quickly became apparent to me. DIPG, or diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, is a pediatric brain tumor that's diagnosed in approximately 35 kids in Canada every year, five or 600 across North America each year, which by definition makes it rare, but not insignificant. Children diagnosed with DIPG die within 10 months and few survive beyond two years. Sobering statistics. With DIPG, getting a diagnosis is not particularly difficult. Since the late 1970s, CT and MRI imaging were used to diagnose DIPG by imaging alone. When viewed under a microscope, DIPG looked exactly like an adult brain cancer called glioblastoma. They were actually characterized under the glioblastoma category in the gold standard reference book published by the World Health Organization and used by pathology and oncology departments around the world. <clears throat> During my PhD, several intense years of research and international collaboration led to a breakthrough. Two novel mutations never before discovered in human cancers. Two years later, the World Health Organization updated its classification with new molecular targets, a new entity, diffuse midline glioma K27M mutant. A small step forward, but hopefully a target for novel therapies. As part of my work, I often had to look at patients' medical records. <clears throat> Sometimes I would have to read an entire medical record. Sometimes I would find the information I was looking for in the first sentence, sometimes in the second, sometimes in the 30th, and sometimes in the last. Using control F does not work. <laughs> A few minutes wasted per patient record, maybe an hour per day. Thousands of hours wasted by clinicians all over the world reviewing clinical records. Sometime last spring, there was a Twitter campaign with the hashtag Science Spelling Bee. The goal was to get uh, people to submit difficult to spell and pronounce uh, medical terms. My submissions were epithelial hemangioendotheliomas and adamantidomous craniopharyngiomas. <laughs> are doctors good at spelling? It turns out they are not. Take a team of five doctors at a hospital that record symptoms and physical findings about a patient. In genetics, we call these phenotypes. Things like short stature, intellectual disability, behavioral problems, microcephaly, congenital anomaly. Take just one of those terms. Over a six-month period, there may be 50 different ways that they're recorded in the patient's medical records. An individual human reading that will probably understand the acronyms, abbreviations, and common terms that are used, but there are over 12,000 standardized terms describing dysmorphologies in humans, 50 ways to spell and misspell each of them. 
lost in translation, misdiagnosis, no diagnosis, a long drawn out diagnostic odyssey. Those 12,000 or so terms have annotations to over, have 115,000 annotations to known genetic disorders. No doctor, no matter how good they are at spelling, will be able to diagnose every single rare disease patient that comes into their clinic. The average rare disease patient sees seven specialist doctors over five years before they get a diagnosis, carrying binders of their medical history from appointment to appointment. And some never get one. Macrodactyly, coloboma, hallux valgus, heterotopic ossifications. I work for Gene42, a company developing smart software to, to standardize the way that data is captured in medical genetics. Things like patient demographics, phenotype information, family history, medical history, pedigree diagrams, genotype information. Available as a free and open source software tool, Phenotypes is used by over 100 research institutions around the world and as part of national research programs in Canada, the United States, and across Europe. Over the past few years, these clinician researchers have diagnosed over 300 new rare genetic conditions and found their associated genetic signatures. Their efforts should be loudly applauded. My colleagues and I are working to, ter to tear down administrative and technological barriers in healthcare. We are building a Canadian, a Canada-wide rare disease repository called Genomics 4RD to help clinicians across Canada diagnose rare disease patients sooner. We believe that standardization, collaboration, will lead to diagnoses for these patients sooner. Thank you. Any questions? What do you see the role of EMRs in helping standardize the way all these things are entered in their systems? Yeah, so I think to some extent it's a little bit difficult for the EMR systems because they're generalists in many ways. Where they can actually help is by implementing standards. Uh, both communication standards, so I mean HL7 being one of those, but now being more and more replaced by FHIR, um, and also initiatives like GA4GH, which uh, we are also uh, a part of, so it's good to see the representat representation here. But for the most part, I think there will be a lot of uh, sort of smaller companies that specialize in particular functionality that will plug in to the EHR systems, uh, and that's where the standardization of the, uh, of the data crosstalk is really important. Any other questions? No more questions? Okay, thank you so much, Pavel. Thank you.